Chers auditeurs, Dear listeners, bonjour. Welcome in Comme d'Archi Podcast Season 3. Saison 3 dans le monde fascinant des architectes. And in the architectural projects. Je suis Anne-Charlotte de Ponte, passionnée d'architecture et docteur des universités en histoire de l'archi. I am one of the spokespersons of Anne Charlotte, who is a PhD in architecture history. Merci. Thank you. D'être avec moi aujourd'hui. To be with us today. Et and maintenant, now, lundi en français, place au talent. And Wednesday, let's talk projects. In English, of course. Bienvenue dans Comme d'Archi. Dear listeners, welcome to the seventh episode of our Comme d'Archi summer series on the theme Short Chronicles and Beautiful Castles. This is Esther on behalf of Anne Charlotte. Today, let's talk about the vast subject of the Chateau d'Annet. Before Diane de Poitiers started the construction of the castle of Annette, two castles existed. The first, dating from the 12th century, was a fortress with thick walls and a round keep, flanked by four towers. A witness to the feudal world, it was the starting point for Philippe Auguste's conquest of Normandy, for which the river Eure formed the border at this precise point. Later, following the revolt of the Lord of Annette, Charles le Mauvais, King of Navarre and Count of Évreux, the fortress was partially dismantled in 1378 by order of King Charles V. Then, by letters given in 1444, Charles VII gave the lordships of Annette, but also of Breval, Montchauvet and Nogent le Roi, to the Grand Seneschal of Normandy, Pierre de Brézé as a thank you for having driven the English out of Normandy. Hence, the second castle of the Dreux-Brézé family. Diane de Poitiers inherited the castle on the death of her husband, Louis de Brézé, in 1531. The construction of the castle commissioned by Diane de Poitiers began with Philibert de Lorme in 1547. The drawings by Jacques-André du Cerceau give us a complete picture of the composition, as the destruction after the French Revolution left only. The front of the main building, saved by Monsieur Lenoir for his Museum of French Monuments, which now stands in the courtyard of the École des Beaux-Arts in Paris. The western wing of the main courtyard, still in place. The entrance, still in place. The chapel, also in situ but truncated in its organization because it was once linked to the eastern wing of the courtyard of honor which has now disappeared. The first wave of work lasted until 1552. The staircase was only completed between 1680 and 1712. Diane de Poitiers wanted to preserve the medieval castle to the east. Philibert de Lorme therefore built the two side wings from 1549 to 1551, the chapel from 1549 to 1552, and the entrance hall in 1552. Alterations were made from 1678 onwards. The gardens were laid out in the 17th century by Le Nôtre and in the 19th century by Buller. The demolition of the building began in 1794 and the destruction of the shell in 1804. What remains is the west wing, which did not have a portico overlooking the courtyard and was probably reserved for offices. The profound alterations, deemed unfortunate in the 17th century, carried out by the Dukes of Vendôme, who were the owners at the time, correspond to the grand staircase with flat vaults built in 1680 by Claude Desco, as well as the Covenant Pavilion. The West Wing lost two bays in the demolition of the central building. The present owners tell the story. The revolution and the years that followed almost led to the destruction of the castle. Confiscated and sold as national property, it was first ransacked, then the demolition workers attacked the building. The central building and part of the right wing were destroyed. From 1840 onwards, the era of restoration began. Five generations of owners, belonging to the same family, have patiently succeeded in restoring this beautiful estate, one of the jewels of French architecture, to some of its former splendor. End of quote. Philibert de Lorme's work represents a building that is in the tradition of the castles of Bury and Saint-Maur, namely 
The buildings are arranged on three sides of a square courtyard. However, Delorme modified the buildings and courtyard of the former Gröbrese Castle to the east and built the rooms and the court of the Jeu de Paume to the west. In the same vein as Bury and Saint-Maur, the main building, massed at the back and favoured by the ends of the side wings, forming a corner pavilion, and, above all, by a central forebuilding treated in the manner of the loggias of the Gaillon entrance pavilion, but with much more rigour. The layout is inspired by that of the Colosseum and presents a completely new monumentality, which is subtly underlined by the sculpted decoration. The French architects of the following generations were to integrate it more closely with the main building, at the same time as they broke the autonomy of the roofs by establishing them in the continuation of each other. The entrance to the main courtyard is an exceptional piece. It transforms in depth the spatial organization of the medieval postern, in the main axis of the courtyard of honor and of the forebuilding of the main building. It consists of two rounded masses pierced by a portal under a semicircular arch framed by Doric columns giving access to a barrel vaulted entrance. The entrance is linked to the side wings by a succession of three rectangular and staggered massives, ensuring the fluidity of circulation through a succession of porticos and corridors. The chapel is one of the first applications in France in sacred architecture of the ideal geometric figure, the shape of which you have already imagined. It is the circle, of course. Circle of the roof light, circle of the dome, circle of the back wall of the chapels, circle of the outer wall of the chapels interrupted by the corner of the sacristies. The pavement itself is made up of arcs that exactly reproduce the projection of the caissons of the dome. This is completely in line with San Pietro in Montori, and even more so with the Pantheon, because in Annette there is no tambour. This obliges the architect to deform the arches and pendatives so that they can play the role of a cylinder wall supporting the rounded base of the dome. As a result, the vaulting of the chapels undergoes a torsion that follows this clever deformation. The surface of the four piers that receive the fall of the arches, that includes the central space, corresponds to flat pilasters, separated by a niche located above an opening, bearing, through capitals formed by two bands of laurels, an entablature that supports the hemisphere of the dome. The dome is decorated with rhomboidal caissons obtained by tracing circles. In this way, it upsets the spatial balance of the upper parts by drowning forms and dimensions in a dilated torsade that pushes the perspectival focus to infinity. On the outside, two pyramid-shaped towers frame the western entrance and house spiral staircases giving access to the tribunes that formerly communicated with the Great Hall on the first floor of the eastern wing. The monocoque dome is supported by horizontal masonry rings set back from each other, which is very reminiscent of the Pantheon technique. However, the roof light, made up of eight pairs of Corinthian columns, supported by eight short arches, is imposing. It strongly punctuates the composition and prepares an articulation of the parts. Delorme was inspired by the centred plan and by the Pantheon in another building built around 1550 in villers cotterets a three-lobed chapel with a dome and peristyle, where he introduced a new order, the French order, which he found better suited to the stone found in France. He encircled the shafts of the columns with decorated rings, which allowed him to vary the thickness of the different tambours of the column. Jean-Marie Perrault de Monclos, in his book L'architecture à la française du milieu du 15e siècle à la fin du 17e siècle, May 2001, specifies The helical ribs of the dome of Annette are undoubtedly inspired by antiquity, but, as far as we know, the development of a perfect helix on a sphere is unprecedented in architecture. Moreover, the division of the circle into a base of 18 parts they are 18 elix departures, can only be obtained by a complex geometric solution. In any case, it is the chapel of Annette that seems to have played a considerable role in Italy, and, 
Palladio may have been inspired by it for the Chapel of Meiser, built in 1580. In the 17th century, François Mansart was inspired by it when he reinterpreted the central plan for the Chapel of the Daughters of the Visitation, 1632-1634. In any case, what scholarly work permitted and transmitted by architectural treatises, treatises of which Philibert de Lorme was one of the worthy French representatives. Dear listeners, thank you for tuning in. Let's meet again next week for a new Summer Kandashi in English. And until then, take care of yourselves. Goodbye. Thank you for listening. Thanks to Julien Robourg, sound engineer, who is collaborating with us today. Don't forget to tune in to our previews on Instagram at Comdarchi Podcast. If you enjoy this podcast, don't hesitate to promote it by giving it five stars and a little comment on Apple Podcasts or on your favorite podcast platform. And above all, subscribe to listen to all of our episodes for free. See you soon, and until then, take care of yourself.